It's August 2020, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Andy, and I'm here with my other host, Patrick. For unfortunate, well, I'll let Patrick tell you. We do ha- we have some great news, a great show, but we also have some not so great news to give you guys a, a heads up on. I don't know, not so great news. I don't know who you're talking you're about. Leaving. Not so great news for. Well, that's not not so great news. That's great news for me. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Not we're, so great news. We're, we're selfish. We want we want to keep you. Well, and technically speaking, we I believe we have one more episode beyond this one that I'm still here for. Um, if we do it right, at least a segment will be coming out of me. I'm not sure if I'll be there for the banter portion. Oh. Hi, mom. <laughs> Your banter is so great. We're going to miss that. Yeah, well, I'm staying with the organization, but moving on to our headquarters, and maybe I'll light a fire for them to start a podcast. Good deal. Good deal. Well, I, I think you should. All right. So this episode, we are going to give a little shout out to some of our logistics folks. You want to give us a little bit of an idea of what that segment's about, Patrick? Yeah, so I mean, I know that last episode we had mentioned about what uh, they were doing a little bit for the getting the building and, and, and getting it ready for us to be able to work in there. And there's still folks in there who have been doing it for, you know, through this whole time, we've had about like 20 to 30 people still going in the building, including our logistics team. And so, um, and it even resulted in our chief of logistics getting an award for, you know, the planning and prep and all that they've been doing. So I got a chance to sit down with our chief of logistics here, uh, Robert Angrisani, as well as our, our building facilities chief, Eric, um, I am blanking on his last name. Silva. Silva. Eric's going to kill me. <laughs> that is so good. Me. Getting uh, put in the banter. I'm so, I'm, say, I'm so glad we don't edit this as heartily as we used to. This is what <laughs> happens when the show evolves. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Eric Silva uh, got a chance to sit down with them via a Skype call as we've been kind of doing all of our uh, interviews now. And just got to talk to him about what it was like to get us ready and to keep the building going throughout this whole pandemic. So uh, that was a, it was a pretty good interview. I think that uh, folks will kind of be interested in what they, what they went through and what they're still going through to make sure that, uh, you know, should we return in full force that the building is, is prepped and, and ready to go. Yeah. And that's an, that's an interesting point is I think many of us thought by this time we would have moved on to the next step and that doesn't seem like it's really happening just yet, but even still, we're still doing the mission. We're, we're still producing. We're still working to make the Commonwealth, community, and country a better place to work and live. So we recorded this or early, and I'll tell the folks that now. I don't even know what my segment's going to be about yet, so we'll have to. That'll be, that'll be your surprise. I'm sure I'll mention it in the show notes, though. But also, this month, we're going to have your Great Places to Work and your new segment, all the lovely voices and faces you're, you're growing to know and, and know and love. So, so what you're saying is we're going to have future Andy edited oh. in after the fact and go, future Andy here, this and is that, the segment that I have. And that's a, I, that's an inside joke. Our chief, when we first started talking about a podcast, he was like, well, you can always come back in and be future Andy. So, yes, I will, I will get a chance to come back, record once I know what I'm go- my segment's going to be on and be future Andy. So that, one, that one's for our chief. He'll, he'll, be, he'll enjoy that. Yes. All right, so I guess it's time to start rolling our segments and getting on with our show. So the first thing I want to do is welcome to the talk, Robert Angrisani and Eric Silva from our logistics office. Uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Good morning. Thank you. So let, let's get into it. Uh, you know, when how many months ago now are we six months ago almost five months ago when this all started to kick off uh you know what was going through your your all's heads on on what we were going to have to do yeah um, certainly from my point of view was you know the facility was still going to be open i knew it wasn't going to be occupied by 300 people but we knew you know essential folks were going to continue to come in the building so you know what we needed to do to keep 
keep everyone safe. Um, I think one of the first things we did was uh, Eric found a bunch of hand sanitizer. You know, I, actually, I take that back. I think the first thing was uh, Colonel K put out the no handshake zone. So we put those signs all over the building, and then we got hand sanitizer. And then from there, you know, we just kept thinking about what we could do to, to provide as much safety for the workforce as they returned. And Eric, for you, uh, you know, talk to me about how, you know, hard or easy or I think hard it was to actually find all of these different supplies that uh, were going to be needed. Well, it wasn't easy at all. Actually, you know, it's you plus 300 people trying to find the same thing you're trying to find. So it's literally trying to find a needle in a haystack. And uh, the only thing I did different was to take no, don't take no for an answer. So having to constantly trying to find resources on top of everything else, you know, I mean, immediately it was one thing after another. It was just a consistency of trying to find everything um, and talking to, uh, working backwards, really talking, uh, uh, actually finding where the product's at and working through who's the manufacturer, the vendors they work with. And it was just a, uh, a backwards workaround, really. And and what were some of the other things that uh, you, we had to, steps we had to go through to uh, get the the building to a place where you could actually have employees come in? Right. So some of the things I'll start Eric. Some of the things we did uh, is we tried to get as much air exchange as we could into the building. So we opened up the outside da air dampers to get the highest exchange rate. Um, we upgraded our uh, filtration to MERV 13, which uh, for for that size microns, you know that the virus is. I think it you know one to three microns in size. The MERV 13 filters are 400 percent better at capturing th that size. Um, so then we also thought about the high touch surface areas. You know anything that gets touched from you know. 300 different people, and uh, so we started sanitizing those areas twice a day um, using using um, Bursch, what, what was that, Bursch 512? Um, we were able to secure that early, and we got 2,000 gallons of it. it. Well, the concentrate creates 2,000 gallons of it, so we've been able to keep up with that. Um, in the restrooms, we automated the uh, the faucets. They're automatic. The paper towel dispensers are automatic. Um, what else and we do, Eric? And the footstool and the foot openers, the door openers, mm -hmm. the footstool. Yeah, we had those going with. Um, and then obviously the temperature taken in the building and the mask. The mask was the hardest thing to get because it was like, you know, again one of those things where we couldn't even get one for a decent amount of, you know, for a, a good price compared to. Fine in bulk. And, and I know that uh, it's not just you two that are, are running around the building doing all this. You have a, 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 a talented and dedicated staff. How many people do you have um, working in logistics now? Logistics, including myself, is 12. Um, so all the all the facility support team has been coming in every day, and uh, supply has been coming in about two days a week. Um, so you have, uh, you know, Thomas Washington and Bernard Butt, who's the uh, the laborers that have been sanitizing twice a day, plus keeping up with their normal janitorial duties. You got uh, Eric doing what he's been doing as the engineering tech, you know, still still having the building systems up and running, but also doing all this to uh, provide the PPE and and supplies we needed for COVID-19 support. Um, Chuck Copeland as the facility manager, uh, you know, assistant Eric uh, where he needed assistance and keeping everybody else gainfully employed, and our two maintenance mechanics, uh, Steve Dixon and Ben Porter, who have still, you know, managed to add some add some projects uh, like the uh, janitor to kitchenette conversions. And how has it been in the building? Uh, you know, obviously we we are way short on. How many people are coming in on a daily basis? Uh, what's the atmosphere like? Well, I mean, I mean, I can comment on that. It's really uh, cut it dry. You know, see the same people every day. You know, you don't really mingle with a lot of people until uh, they come in, and then you kind of realize, you know, you kind of miss a human interaction after a while with certain, you know, people you used to talk to or whoever. I mean, it's it's doable. It gets it gets us by. It's just you know, you can see it's. It's missed. And for you, Robert, uh, you got recognized uh, through an award. Can you uh, can you talk about what that award was uh, that was um, 
presented to you? Sure. That was the meritorious logistician of the year, um, and uh, it, I, it's a board that that they uh, they meet in headquarters. Um, you know, so all the different regions submit submit their nominees, and uh, I believe there was six total that received the award out of you know everyone in logistics throughout the country. So it was it was a uh, it was a big deal for the team. Um, and obviously, I accept it as as part of the team. You know, one person can do very little. A team of twelve that we have. I mean, we got after it, and the whole the whole district. You know, we got out after a lot of the programs. It wasn't just the uh, COVID nineteen support. It was you know our TMDE program, our fuels program, um, ramping up for the CLRP, which is an inspection of all of our logistics programs. Um, and, and the whole team really, really jumped in, and we improved a lot of our, a lot of our systems this year. Uh, and going forward, as we as we look, um, obviously, you know, the numbers around Hampton Roads uh, here continue to kind of climb back up again. Um, so, the likelihood of the building coming back open to full capacity seems to be moving to the uh, to the right a bit. But uh, you know. If any employees were to, interested in coming in, you know, how safe is the building? I feel very comfortable, and I, I wouldn't, you know, have my employees come in, uh, you know, if I didn't feel comfortable. Um, the district is doing really well at social distancing. Um, you, you know, no handshaking, hardly any elbow bumping. We're really trying to stay away from each other. Um, it, it's it's difficult to remind yourself when you leave your office to, to put your mask on, but people are really, really, you know, jumping on board and doing what they need to do to protect each other. And again, I feel like the building is sanitized. It's uh, it's safe. And for you, Eric, uh, you know, what are, what are some of the challenges uh, looking ahead as, you know, I'm, I'm sure that other buildings in the area are also looking at uh, reopening sometime in the distant near future, um, uh, probably getting the same supplies and, and such and, and, and equipment in that, that they need to get opened. Uh, any challenges that you're seeing uh, as we go forward? Um, the only challenge I would see if we stay behind the curve of getting the uh, PPE Man, as long as we, we maintain the PPE the way this, the district is going now, I think it's on the right path. The only curve I see us having is if we stay behind, if we get behind on ordering PPE and making sure our stock is completely going because we don't only stock us. We stock the local uh, uh, the districts around us uh, try to help them out when they can't find anything on their end. So, you know, the only thing I would say that would be a rough end would be just making sure we have our PPE stocked up. Great. Uh, anything else you guys want to add that I have, uh, may have forgotten to ask? No, yeah, not off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to thank you both for uh, taking time out of your day to to join us on Core Talk, um, and I'm sure that uh, as we go forward, uh, we'll get some more updates from y'all. Excellent. Thanks for having us, yes, Patrick. Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Thank you. Hi, it's Future Andy here to introduce my Women's Equality Month segment that I recorded with Tanya Willis, who is an Equal Employment Opportunity Specialist with the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Enjoy. I'm interested in this topic specifically because um, it's still a thing. And these days, these observances, there is a reason. There is a reason. And inequality didn't always look like you know uh, over aggression it was smaller cuts and diminishing things you know i just and i know you guys are this is something you guys you know are working for all the time so i appreciate what you do i realize a little bit more about <laughs> what you guys do i just hope that through this conversation people who don't think this applies to them women's equality day will understand that it does and it applies to all of us and a little bit why. So right. uh, we're talking about Women's Equality Day, August 26th. The question is, when did it happen? When did it come about? Why is it a thing? All right, so if you didn't know, Andy, uh, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment for the women in the United States. 
So since 1971, Women Equality Day was celebrated in the United States based on the 1920 adoption of the 19th Amendment, which prohibits states and the federal government from denying the right to vote to citizens of the United States on the basis of sex. So women equality started years ago, began in 1848 during the women's suffrage movement, which women fought for the right to vote. Um, as I stated before, women didn't have the right to vote until 1920 in most states. So they didn't have the same civil rights as men. And as well as women, uh, men also fought together with women. Like I said, uh, they gave speeches, they petitioned, they published newspapers, they traveled across the country to have their voice heard. Um, they created conventions. So this is their focus, their attention on women continuing efforts to gain equality. Um, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the struggles and achievement that uh, Women Equality Day um, has came about to clear barriers, to enforce laws and implement new changes for women in the workplace and also in society. Excellent. Beautiful. So you said it wasn't until, so we made a little bit of movement, but it wasn't until 1965 that essentially all women of voting 1971. age. Could, 19, 1971. 1971. 1971. Yep. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm getting seasoned into my seasoned years. No, I'm but, sorry. I'm sorry. 1920 is when they adopted the 19th amendment. The 19th amendment. Which since 1971, the women's quality day has been celebrated as gotcha. a holiday. Got you. Got you. Okay. But, you know, still, and all that stuff, like, it's not, it's pretty recent. You know, yeah. these aren't things that happened hundreds of years ago. This is still a relevant thing. And I'm sure there's still lingerings of, of issues that, that we're still looking at today uh, involved with that. So, so that's a question. We got some of the history. Mm -hmm. Now, what does, what does Women's Equality Day look like today? And if we have, if we're able to. Let's talk about what women's equality in general looks like. So um, based on statistics, women have been in the workforce for more than 100 years now. So things have certainly changed for women today. Uh, federal laws are in place today. Women serving as judges, members of Congress, setting world records in sports, um, founding co uh, companies, and fighting on the front lines of combat. Um, on January 24th of 2013, the ban preventing military women from serving in direct combat roles was lifted. So since that time, the military service has opened up like 110,000 positions to women to continue to tear down the barriers and shatter glass ceilings. And um, also they reported in 2018, from 1970 to 2018, women in STEM have went from 7% to 26%. So in the United States today, women make up slightly more than half the workforce. So despite some of the significant strides we made, women still face significant obstacles um, at work and beyond such as wages and quality, parental leave, unrepresentation in certain fields and industries, leadership and management roles, and educational opportunities. So um, in 2018, the Department of Labor Women Bureau, they reported that women in full-time jobs only make $789 compared to men who, make who makes $973. Mm -hmm. yeah. So women has made strides, but there's still things in the work sector and also society that still holding um, us back. We have the right to vote, but it's still change that needs to be made. And sometimes that change is not just not something big and not a, not a Super Bowl size, Super Bowl Sunday size. It's just like you like you touched on representation, uh, yeah. getting women in more of man management positions. And these are things we do tend to see a, a lack of of other women in. So it's good that we're we're recognizing and praising that and putting those models up front. Now, we have the principles of Women's Equality Day. How do we, all of us, men, women, apply these principles to make this observance meaningful? What can we, essentially, what can we do, Tanya, to, to make this come to fruition for positive change? So as far as the guidance principles, together um, we can increase awareness that gender equality is a social issue that engages both men and women. Um, as a district, as a society, we should work together as a team to take care of each other. So it's giving the right attitude towards every employee, no matter their race, gender, or background, to accomplish that one goal, that one mission we all have, being inclusive by celebrating all women, being able to have men and women collaborate together to avoid a gen gender gap in the workplace. Different mindsets, different decision-making together to come to reach that one goal. Um, innovation is a necessary requirement for organizations to prosper and grow. 
So as we continue to strive for workplace policies to assure fairness and equal opportunity that can reduce inequality and improve female representation across the management line to include that um, to build that more inclusive workplace as far as professional and personnel excellence, just involved involved in uplifting each other and showing dignity and respect to one another. Um, continuing to encourage mentor, mentorship and leadership development for women, engaged in aligning our personal professional goals for women, and communication is key as well to know what women's goals are and what their needs are in the workplace. Gender equality is, is not only a human right, but it's necessary to achieve a peaceful, thriving, sustainable world and workplace. Um, everybody should take pride in that in the society, ensure everyone is valued, um, no matter what your gender is. So having policies in place and in in the um, workplace to ensure everyone is doing what's right legally and morally. Yeah, you, you touched on a couple of things. And I think that the one thing that hits me, the first thing I share that hits me is that representation. When I right. think back to when I was oh so long ago in elementary school and what American history looked like, it was very white male. I mean, that's, that's what we learned that was history, our founding fathers. When it's not that it's not important, but you see, you you have to kind of wonder, if, what if we, those principles that you just said, what if they had been in place and you, you're seeing different sides of the same story and, and different people rise up and different things happen that, you know, we can only surmise, but it would have, would have been interesting. So that's the first thing is that representation. And two, I, what I'm gleaning from those principles, and tell me if I'm um, somewhat on the right track, is all of us being wise enough and aware enough to kind of pause and say, am I treating everybody with the same set of dignity and respect? I like this observance, like just stop and think. And even, you know, all, we're all good people who sometimes do some crummy things. And maybe one of those crummy things is maybe we don't spend enough time thinking about how the same situation affects people who are different than us. Like you said, we should definitely, um, you know, women quality focus on not just women, but how at men and women can work together to assure equality. Um, I know a lot of men think, you know, it's just a women holiday. <laughs> We're but, on holiday. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just going to show and celebrating how, how far women have came with the help along with the men, as I will talk about later, that have men had to play a role in women equality. See, and that's this is this is what I think is so cool. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the, the floor on this. So let's officially let's officially ask you, what role do men play in women's equality? Okay. So <laughs> since <laughs> since August uh 18, 1920, the fate of the Ninth of Amendment came down to a single vote. That single vote was in the hand of a man. Um, his name was Harry T. B uh, Byrne, and he planned to vote against the uh, amendment. He didn't want to sign the amendment um, for women to have the right to vote. What changed his mind was a letter that he kept from his mother telling him to vote for the amendment so she can have the opportunity to vote for legislators just like him. So he took what his mom said in that letter and thought about his mom and put it in a personal perspective, and he voted for the amendment, which allowed the 19th Amendment to pass nationwide. Always so listen to your mom. It, Always yeah. listen to your mom. That's rule one. Go ahead. So you think about it, the 19th Amendment wouldn't have been passed if it wasn't for Harry T. Byrne or him reflecting back on a woman in his life on how this would affect his mom. So men have always played a critical role in the women movement. From John Stuart Mills to Frederick Douglass, men allies had they long supported the struggle for gen general equality. A lot of people don't know that, but women, not only women fought in the women's suffrage movement, but men as well, alongside mm -hmm. um, women. Interesting. So gender equality is a responsibility, like I said, for everyone, um, no matter your age, background, or your gender. Um, men behavior has a profound effect on women's careers, success in their lives. You think about it, men hold most of the decision-making authority in both the public and the private sector of the United States, so their voices are predominantly mostly heard. As, like I said, I mentioned before, the population participation rate of men in the workplace uh, versus women, men have a higher participation rate. Um, also, men's role can include empowerment of women and becoming allies and partners against all forms of discrimination, becoming active supporters in the workplace as well, as most leaders are men. So um, men can start introducing fair employment practices, anti-discrimination measures, and make a gender have gender-inclusive decision-making in their firms or companies or uh, in the military. So men, role, men have a huge role and was, was right for creating a society where both men and women have equal voices. Yeah, this is this is a symbiotic kind of relationship. 
we have to work with each other and and kind of be on the same page in order for everybody to benefit. It's not just. I, although I do like what was it Women's Day? <laughs> I do like yeah. think about that, but it's actually just one part of, as I understand it, just trying to celebrate all humans and and recognize what we have to do to make sure we're all included. So I like that. What standards does the Army Corps and the Norfolk District have in place that support the principles of Women's Equality Day? Okay, so right now in NAO, um, our workforce is 42% female. So in regards to the guiding principles and um, you saying NAO continue to show that every individual you know, had an opportunity to maximize his or her potential. Um, the military, as I mentioned before, had made many strides to eliminate barriers to service and remains committed to ideas that every American is titled for equal treatment and opportunity. Um, you say NAO leaders continue to develop, foster, and sustain a culture that allows women the opportunity to pursue their goals and to grow not personally but also professionally. Some things that we, uh, NAO and USA have in place is the leadership program, which is open to all NAO employees, the mentorship program, mandatory training on a matter such as unlawful discrimination, anti-harassment, sexual harassment, and sexual assault, and prohibited personnel practices. We have flexible work schedules and also telework. So I think there are different standards um, that's being placed at the headquarter level and also the district level to make sure that uh, women, not only women, but everyone has an equal opportunity when it comes to the workplace. And I think there's room to also add, you know, more standards and more programs to ensure that we are targeting and um, affording everyone the right opportunity. During the pandemic, dur during the COVID-19 pandemic, when everything you know shut down, a lot of my friends who are mothers, either they lost their job, they, they had no child care. And now that they're looking to go back to work, it's the schools aren't open. So they have to choose between either I can have my career back or I can raise my children. Now, that's yeah. the hardest. I mean, how do you, you have to, <laughs> yeah. and I feel that's been the female burden to a burden to carry for what I've experienced in my life. The Norfolk district, in my opinion, and, and definitely my, my supervisor and uh, Colonel Kinsman and leadership on down has been so supportive of, I feel mothers, during this time when school is not in session, being able right. to do both parenting and and have a career. And I don't see that in many other organizations. Yeah. So who's ever making that decision, I'm a big fan of that. And I think yeah. that's part of what's going to help us make it so we can raise our children and we can have our career and we don't have to sacrifice one for the other. If someone, if a female feels that she's in a situation uh, where she's getting, she's directly being targeted, uh, feeling that there, there's a lack of equality w between her and her male counterparts. What does she need to do? How does that process work? So um, if a female employee is feeling that way, our uh, first thing is tell them, you know, speak to that supervisor. Um, that supervisor can address their needs, then continue to go up the chain of command and also use the open door policy with the commander. But as well, if, you know, it falls in line to discrimination as far as EEO, they can not come in the EEO office and file an EO complaint, as well as we have a special emphasis program um, that we're trying to stand up, where it focuses on equal opportunity for minority and women. So, um, if women in the district, you know, feel like you know, it's low representation or they want to make a change, they definitely can join um, our special emphasis program, and that's where we can put on workshops. Um, we can do things inclusive for women or minorities, um, and address those concerns that a woman may have in the workplace. Okay. So since you put the invite out there, uh, and folks might have to listen to this and rewind it, what is a number or an email, or how do people feel like, yeah, I want to be part of that program? How do they get involved? Yes. Um, you can contact myself or, or Jennifer O'Quinn, who is the EEO manager, or you can contact us by email, um, my phone number. <laughs> Looking real quick. <laughs> Look, I got to do the same thing. I have business cards only so I can know my own. My phone number, which is 757-985-5068. Uh, and uh, Jennifer O'Quinn number is 757-201-7054. Or we can be reached at our email address, which you can find that on Outlook 
And um, also, if you like to talk to us in person, we also take appointments where we can come in the office and, and talk to and assist you as well. And, and, to, and to that point, I know because we've used it for recording, y'all have a soundproof room. So if someone is yes. nervous about that, you kind of mitigate that fear by saying, hey, you know what, you're good to go. So what yes. I'll do is I'll also put your contact information in our show notes so people can refer to it later on. Okay. So, so what, um, what I'd like to close with is just like give a quick, if you can, off the top of your head, just tell people yeah. what, especially if they weren't prior service, what is mm -hmm. EEO or if they understand what MEO was, how does it convert? How is it? Just a little bit about your office. Okay. So the EEO office, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Office, um, we covered uh, discrimination in the workplace. Um, we're here to ensure that discrimination doesn't happen in the workplace. But if you feel like you have been discriminated against, you can contact um, the EEO office and we can um, assist you in, um, if you need to file a complaint. Um, and that process is a lengthy process. And it, you know, it, it varies, depends on your uh, situation. So if you do have any concerns, please contact the EEO office. Um, we do other things other than complaints, as I mentioned, the special emphasis program where we focus on minority and women and ensuring they have equal opportunity. We focus on affirmative employment, so ensure everyone has equal opportunity as far as training, promotion, advancement, um, hiring. So the EEO office is a, we do have a lot of programs, but we're here. Um, if you have any questions or you want any more information, please stop by, send us an email. We got brochures. I sent out quarterly email, uh, quarterly <laughs> newsletters um, to keep you updated on EEO and um, things that may affect you and also help you with self-development as well. Cool. So a, a good takeaway is if people aren't sure if they have an issue, to just come and talk with you because yes. you'll be able to guide them either way, I would think. So that, that's, right. nice, that's nice to know because I think that's something that women go through. Maybe men do too. I don't know how the male brain works. But sometimes they question, well, is it me? Am I making this up? Like, what did I do? So so it'd be, it's nice that, that you guys are there as almost like, hey, be my litmus test. Tell me if this is something me or if it's something otherwise. So that's that's great to know that we have you guys there for the end. And, and y'all are pretty cool. I do. Yeah. And I also want to just, just, add, just advocate or just say that um, the EO office is here to tell you your rights and, um, and give you your rights and give you options. When you do come to us, even if it doesn't fall in the EEO, it may fall in the union, it may fall in HR or um, IG. Um, we're here to give you resources, but uh, then again, we're not here for management or employees. We're neutral. Um, ah. Everything we do is federal law, so we're not here to give advice. Um, we're just here to show you the process and give you the resources you need to make a informed decision on whatever you decide to do. People come in and ask, what should I do? Or, <laughs> We are. <laughs> um, we're not here to give uh, personal advice. We are here to give you facts <laughs> and the law, and also give you resources so you can make that decision. Look, you send them to me. I give out advice to everybody. They don't even have to ask me. So you just send them to all men, and she'll she'll, <laughs> she'll take care of it. Should know better. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here with us today and being able to talk with us and shed a little bit of light on this observance or if there's some questions that our listeners have for eo eo we can get that to you and we can address some of those anonymously on the podcast maybe in the future right exactly that, thank okay. you all right thanks you gotta get up get up and let's make something happen you gotta get up get up get up All right, now it's time for your news from around the district. World War II era warehouse at Richmond Depot to get major overhaul. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Defense Logistics Agency are teaming up on a project to restore a Defense Supply Center Richmond warehouse built in 1942. Seagrass restoration, part of Lower Chesapeake Bay Watershed Ecosystem Project. The district has placed safety signage for the Lynn Haven River Basin Ecosystem Restoration Project's submerged aquatic vegetation, also known as SAV, planting efforts in Broad Bay near First Landing State Park within the Lynn Haven River watershed on July 30th. Corps sets up virtual public scoping room for Suffolk Landfill Project. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is currently reviewing a Southeastern Public Service Authority 
proposal to expand landfill operations at the existing regional landfill, landfill in Suffolk through the environmental impact statement process. Mosquito treatments for federal property over Craney Island are being advertised on the website now. You can also find those updates on our social media channels. In addition to the mosquito spray updates, we also are featuring Gathright Dam's pulse release schedule. You can check that out on our website. So as far as our Great Places to Work segment, we do have one job that we're hiring for. It's a program support assistant, office automation. This is closing August 21st. It is a GS8 permanent position located at the Norfolk District. So for this position, and as you can see, I have my USA job. Well, if you can't see, if you're not watching on YouTube, but if you're watching on YouTube, I pull it up right on my phone. This is to assist and advise division leadership on administrative and personnel management matters. Plan, coordinate, and perform working work involving several processes such as various software systems, mail distribution, electronic timekeeping, presentation, and reports, production, and real property management. So again, that job is a GS8, Program Support Assistant, Office Automation, closing out August 21st. You can find that on our, all of our social media platforms as well as our website. And with that, we've finished our August 2020 episode of Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. All of the information that we discussed during this show will be found in the show notes. I'd like to thank our guests on the show today, Robert Angrazani, Eric Silva, and Tanya Willis. The graphics for today's show were by Travis Burcham and Ashley L. Kiesler. Remember that all our previous shows are available on our YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as on our website. Those links will be in the show notes. So until next time, this is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District QS Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. Core Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters Building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the district's public affairs staff.